Okay, so um, today I'm very excited to introduce uh, Professor Somal Vonsel. So uh, Somal did his graduate career with me at UC Berkeley, and uh, we worked a lot together on uh, various uh, approaches to, to safety analysis. And then he started exploring a lot into um, how to combine safety and learning, uh, especially when you're learning things like, like perception and you need to embed safety into your system for that. And so uh, through this, uh, he's done multiple projects uh, and uh, ranging from you know, directly training a neural network to, to control a system to you know, higher and higher levels of abstraction, reasoning, and, and, and combining them together. And so he has a lot of thoughts about where the role plays within safety analysis and, and how we can continue to, to push on this direction. Right now, he is uh, doing a postdoc at Waymo. And so in the spirit of that, I, uh, our reading this week is actually the Waymo safety framework and the Waymo safety data, uh, both of which uh, Somo sent me not too long ago. Uh, and then after doing this one year postdoc, he's going to become a professor at USC, University of Southern California, which is right near us in Los Angeles. Uh, so with that, I'll give it to you, Somo. Thank you. Oh, and Somal said that you can go ahead and interrupt him if you have questions throughout the talk. Yeah, please, please. Uh, I want you to be interactive so anytime. If you have any question, feel free to uh, interrupt me. Um, but thank you, Sylvia, for a very nice introduction. Very, very excited to see you and also very excited to interact with your class. Um, so Sylvia gave me a lot of freedom on picking the topic for this class. Uh, so I just ended up deciding pick, um, picking Deep Reach which is essentially a tool um, that I recently worked on. Uh, and, the, and what DeepRis does is that it learns high dimensional reachable sets using machine learning. Um, now, if, if I would have time in the end, I would also probably touch upon the reverse problem, which is how we can use Hamilton Jacobi reachability analysis to provide safety guarantees about machine learning. So, um, I know you probably have seen Hamilton Jacobi reachability several times at this point, but let me quickly provide a five minute overview of Hamilton Jacobi reachability that will help us set up like the notation for the rest of the talk. Um, so broadly, I'm interested into the, the safety analysis of autonomous systems and Hamilton Jacobi reachability is, uh, is, is a great tool for providing safety guarantees for autonomous systems. Um, and in Hamilton Jacobi reachability analysis, we characterize the safe and unsafe states for the um, for the system using the concept of backward reachable set. Um, and uh, what does it mean is that given a particular target set, which I'm denoting by curly L here, backward reachable set represents the uh, set of all states for which all possible control actions, there exist a disturbance action that will ultimately drive the system inside that target region within a time horizon T. So what does that mean pictorially is that if the target region um, is this dark brown circle, or these are the set of unsafe states in this case. Then the backward reachable set is this um, sort of light orange region here. Um, and, and, uh, and what that means is that if, I, if my aircraft, in this particular case, this is an example, started this brown dot, then eventually, no matter what control does, disturbance will be able to push it inside the target region or inside the set of unsafe states, this brown circle over here. Which means that the set of, uh, which means the states in the backward reachable set themselves can be unsafe and should be avoided for the system. You can also think about the converse of the backward reachable set, which is this uh, gray region over here. And what that means is that if the system starts inside the gray region, that no matter what disturbance does, we have a control strategy, which will make sure that the system is never gonna end up in this brown region over here. And hence the system is guaranteed to be safe. Um, there are other different notions of backward reachable set, for example, where the target set is actually the set of desired states, for example, our goal states, in which case the backward reachable set represents the set of states from which we can reach those goal states. And then there are reach avoid set as well, where we want to go to a target set while avoiding some other set of states. So let me quickly pause here and ask Sylvia. Sylvia, the, um, the class is aware of all these definitions or should I go into details of any of those? Uh, yes, and also the difference between a set and a tube. 
Wonderful. Okay, so what I'm showing here is a backward reachable tube in that case, not a set. <laughs> Uh, so a policy is if I'm calling it backward reachable set throughout the talk, but I will try to make it clear when it actually matters. <laughs> um, so in hamilton jacobi reachability, the autonomous system is represented as a dynamical system with dynamics F, state X, control U, and disturbance D. And the evolution of that dynamical system over time is represented by this ordinary differential equation, which we also call the dynamics of the system. And given these dynamics, what we do is we set up a game between the disturbance and the control where disturbance attempts to push the system inside the unsafe region in this dark brown region over time, whereas the control attempts to um, make sure that the system remains safe or outside this brown region in this case. And luckily the solution to this game can be found using the principle of dynamic programming, which results into hamilton jacobi Isaac's variational inequality uh, which probably you've seen before. Um, so we have a PDE term in the variational inequality, and then we want to make sure that we are no, our trajectories are not escaping the target region after entering it. And I will go into the more details of each of these um, in subsequent slides. I just wanted to provide a one slide summary of hamilton jacobi reachability. And once we can compute this value function, then the backward reachable tube in this case is given by the sub-zero level set of that value function which is also this, uh, the region within the black boundary in this case. Okay, so as I promised, let's consider a very concrete example uh, very quickly, just to, uh, just to ground these concepts. So suppose we are interested in computing the backward reachable tube, um, says that we want to avoid all the furniture in this room. So our dark brown region that I was showing in the previous slide corresponds to the furniture in this room in this case. So the first step to compute backward reachable tube is to define the dynamics of the system. In this case, um, my, my robot, which is also a turtle bot, can be modeled very well using a four dimensional model, um, which consists of position of the vehicle, PX and PY, its speed and its angle. Now my control are given by the acceleration and angular speed. And there is some disturbance in the dynamics. Now these could be actual disturbance in the dynamics, meaning somebody's trying to maybe push the turtle bot or this could be just some unmodeled dynamics effect. For example, the friction between the tire and the floor that we haven't explicitly captured in this model. Next, we need to define this, our target set or the set of states that we want to avoid. In this case, obstacles is what we want to avoid. So that's our target set. And then everything else is our free space. So let's just see the same target set from the top view. So this dark, Gray region represents the set of all the furniture, um, sorry, represent all the furniture in the room. And then the white represents this free space. Um, next, we want to represent our target set as a sub zero level set of, of some function L of X, right? So I'm just showing one such candidate L of X over here. You can see it is negative inside the dark gray region and positive outside. And one such function, which is prime, very popular in robotics is the sign distance function to the obstacle, which is positive outside the obstacles and negative inside the obstacle. And then we set up a zero sum differential game between the control and the disturbance. Um, now this is a lot of math going on here, but essentially what this means is that uh, the disturbance is trying its best to push the system trajectory inside the obstacle or inside this dark gray region over time, whereas control is trying to avoid it. And then we let the disturbance and control fight it out and figure out from which states the disturbance would win and from which states control would win. And that solution to this game between disturbance and control can be obtained using the principle of dynamic programming, which results into this hamilton jacobi Isaac's variation inequality, which I showed earlier, starting from our terminal value function L of X which represents our target set. Um, we probably have seen this before. H here is the Hamiltonian, which encodes the role of dynamics, control, and disturbance in this entire propagation of the value function. Now, if, um, if, if you want to sort of make the connection of this with the, um, with, with, the, with the discrete time, or if you are coming from the discrete time background, then you can think of um, the hamilton jacobi Isaac's expression inequality as nothing but a generalization of Bauman equation to continuous time and in the presence of disturbances. Okay, so let's see this dynamic programming in action. So we start from L of X and then you can see 
we are applying the Hamilton Jacobi ice acceleration inequality and our value function is slowly converging. And then finally, what we get is this red value, red function, which is our converse value function. And once converse, the backward reachable tube, sorry for writing set here, is given by the sub zero level set of this value function. And obviously using this value function, we can also obtain the optimal control for the system, which is essentially the, uh, in this case is the Hamiltonian maximizing control. Okay, so let me just show you the same backward reachable tube in the top view. Uh, so remember that our value function, even our backward reachable set is a function of four states, right? Because our, dam our system has four states in this case. What I'm showing you here is a slice of that backward reachable tube in the position space uh, of the vehicle. And so the gray again represent the obstacles or the furniture and the red is the boundary of the backward reachable tube. So let me pause here for a, uh, for a quick second and give you a little bit of intuition what this backward reachable tube represent in this specific case for this specific vehicle. So recall that these are the dynamics of the system, which consist of position, velocity, and, and, and the heading of the vehicle estate. Again, I'm showing you a 2D slice of that backward reachable tube in the position space for a heading of pi by two, meaning the robot is actually facing upwards towards the top of the screen and speed is positive. Now you see a retraction in the boundary of the backward reachable tube here, meaning it's not hugging L of X. What does it mean is that if the robot starts at any position beyond this red point, that means the robot does not have enough time to stop and avoid a collision with the obstacle in front of it. And this retraction in the boundary is exactly representing that, that you should not cross this red boundary, otherwise you will not be able to avoid a collision. On the other hand, you can see at this position, the backward reachable tube boundary is hugging obstacle because the robot is moving forward in this direction. So it has a lot of time to stop and avoid a collision. If I were to see the slice of the backward reachable tube with the heading of minus pi by two, meaning the robot is facing downwards towards the screen, then you will have seen a retraction here and the boundary hugging the obstacle in this region. But luckily for us, we don't need to reason about each state because hamilton jacobi reachability provides us the, the safe set of states um, at in the entire in the entire state space in in using that hamilton jacobi pde that we looked into previous slide and for any system All right um, except uh, the picture is a little bit less rosy than that because it suffers from the curse of dimensionality um, in particular the the time and memory requirements to compute backward reachable tube or set grows exponentially as the number of states increases in my system so let me go into a little bit more details of why such curse of dimensionality exists and how we can potentially overcome it. So first, before we can think about how to overcome this curse, let's, let's try to understand why this curse fundamentally exists. Now, one of the reasons for why this curse exists for level set matters is because they compute these hamilton jacobi um, or they, they, they compute these backward reachable tubes over a grid in the state space. And as the number of states increases, the number of grid points increases, um, and hence the computation increases uh, exponentially. But there's something more than that too. Um, and to understand that, let's consider two different value functions, right? So in the one case, the value function levels are just given by concentric circles, and this is just the backward reachable tube in that case. And in the other case, the value function um, levels are um, given by these, this weird looking amoeba. So this is the my backward reachable tube here. In this case. Now, a, a grid-based method would actually spend equal amount of computation and time on computing these two value functions, which is, which is a little bit, does not seem intuitively correct, right? To represent a circular value function is much, much simpler than representing this amoeba-shaped value function. So why am I spending equal time on representing both of these value functions? And so for this grid-based method, the computation is dominated by the state space dimension and not necessarily by the underlying complexity of the value function that we're trying to represent. And that begs the question 
can I overcome part of this computation complexity if I use better representations of the value function? And indeed, several people have thought about this question. Um, and, and that's why there are other reachability-based methods which use shapes like polyhedra or ellipsoids to represent the value function. Because with those representation, in some cases, you can represent the value function much more easily. But then, then what we don't know is in which case should I use a polyhedra? Or in which case I should use ellipsoid? Or is there a third shape uh, that might be even better for my value function? So one solution is that we learn the representation itself for the value function. In other words, we learn a parameterized approximation of the value function using a neural network. And let me just quickly explain what that means and then I will pause and see if people have any question. Um, so what we do is we represent the value function using a neural network which takes as input the state and time at which we want to compute the value function. The parameters of the neural network are given by theta. And what the neural network output is the value at that state and that at that time. Okay, so let me pause here for a second and see if there are any questions. Uh, that sounds great. Okay, so great. It seems like we have bypassed the problem of coming or, or bypassed the problem of fixing a representation for our value function. But then, how am I going to learn the parameters of this neural network such as to get a good value function at the output? And one popular scheme in literature to do that is supervised learning. So, what do we do in supervised learning, or what does it even mean? In supervised learning, Somebody, don't ask me how, gives you the labels, or in other words, the value function corresponding to some state and time. So maybe somehow magically we can compute the value function for some state and time, and that's like V star here. So I'm given these states and times and the corresponding values. Then what I do is I, I try to optimize for my neural network parameters such as I minimize the gap between what I know is the correct value function and what my neural network is predicting. In other words, I'm incentivizing my neural network to predict V star as closely as it can. And the way generally these parameters are optimized is through stochastic gradient descent in which you take a bunch of data, data points, which is also called batch. So for example, you take thousand of them at a time and then you compute what is the gradient of this function and then you move in the direction of gradient in the hope to minimize it over time. And then we repeat this procedure. We take another thousand samples. We again compute the loss function. We again move in the direction of gradient. Keep doing it until the until the parameters converge. Okay, so that's the idea behind supervised learning. Um, and I'm sure it will work well, except that how to get V star? I mean, our this is like a circular argument. The whole problem I'm trying to solve is to get the value function for high dimensional systems. So how I'm gonna come up with the high dimensional value function in the first place. And that's a limitation of supervised learning. So we need to go to a method which does not necessarily explicitly rely on the supervision of my value function. And that's, that's the problem that DeepRe is aiming to solve at its core. In particular, we, propose a self-supervised learning method for learning the value function. And how can we come up with such a method? To understand that, let's go back to our very basic partial differential equation. So for a minute, assume that I'm computing backward reachable set. So I don't have this variation inequality, but only a beautiful PDE that I need to solve, right? Which is that looks like this. And I know if my value function is correct, then this PDE should be zero everywhere for each state and time, right? And I use this property as my learning signal. In other words, what I will do is I will sample state and time, and then I ask my neural network to minimize this term over here, right? And by the time the neural network will make it all zero, then I know I have learned the correct value function. And what does that mean pictorially? Is that I will start with some random parameters theta, right? And then on the x-axis, I'm showing you x and t collapse to a single dimension. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting this magnitude of partial differential equation left-hand side here, right? Now, when I start with a random theta and I randomly sample some x, t, I would not expect them to be all zero, right? Because you just start with some random theta. 
So the, there will be some values here. But what I will do is that I will optimize theta so as to move all these value towards zero. And that's what deep is going to do. So it will randomly sample state and time. Then it will apply this loss function, which is the left-hand side of the PDE. And then it will update the parameters of the neural network so as to minimize this loss. And it will keep doing this as for as many iterations as you want or until the parameter converges. And so we do not require an explicit supervision or the true value function corresponding to those states and times. I have a question. Yeah. So you're sampling randomly in state and time, whereas normally in the reachability, we essentially sample all the points in state and then move back a time step and then sample it all, move the time step and do dynamic programming. Right. Uh, is there any way in which uh, like uh, doing the time sampling sequentially rather than randomly would be better or worse? That's a very good point. Actually, um, um, actually we do sample the time sequentially. So what we do is we keep moving this horizon slowly backwards in time. Within that horizon, we sample randomly, but we only move it slowly over time, just like we do in Halper OC, for example. Okay. And that's Thanks. very important for the learning to work. And I will explain that a little bit more in more detail uh, in, in subsequent slides. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I had a question as well. Um, could you explain the the reasoning behind the the loss function being zero again? Is it just because of that's the safety threshold? And also uh, another question was um, so in a in a practical system, I guess how would you be able to randomly sample this state uh, if you, for example, didn't have a great simulator? Good point. Okay, so uh, so let me let me try to answer both question. So first was, what's the reasoning behind choosing this as the loss function? The, the reasoning is that um, essentially my loss function should be such that, the, that by the time my objective is zero, I have, or my loss function is zero, I have obtained the true value function, right? And I know for the true value function, this term over here should indeed be zero, right? Because that's the condition for the dynamic programming that we get by the dynamic programming, right? So that's why I picked this as a loss function. So as I make this term towards zero, I am obtaining better and better value function. Can I, can I very quickly, sometimes we don't, we don't write the full H, often we do the inner product. So this should look familiar in terms of when we write it all out, it's the partial with respect to T plus the inner product between the partial with state and the dynamics. Um, optimized over that equals zero. That was the Hamilton Jacobi Isaacs partial differential equation that we derived in class. So in, in theory, it should equal zero. Oh, okay. so, um, yeah, and uh, your second question was how to sample state and time. So the, the, the state, um, so I'm, I'm trying to understand your question better. So you're saying that when you don't have a simulator, so simulator, gives me, um, so you, you, do you mean like we don't have the dynamics available? Is that the question? Because simulator um, generally are used for dynamics, not necessarily for sampling the state, or, or maybe I did, uh, did not understand the question correctly. Oh, so I guess uh, if you were using a real system, then I, I guess you just run it online and then use random samples from that, right? Is that how you do it? Oh, okay, uh, good question. So. So this is totally offline. So um, we, are, we are computing the reachable tube for a system whose dynamics are known, whose state space is known, and we're just computing it offline. Okay. Yeah. The, um, sorry, any other question before I move on? Cool. Um, there is one slight problem with the formulation that I presented earlier. So let me go back to the previous slide. Um, there's actually a trivial value function that satisfies uh, or that will make this loss function equals to zero, which is a constant value function. 
right? Any constant value function would make this term to be exactly equal to zero because the gradient will be zero with respect to time, gradient with respect to state will be zero, so Hamiltonian will be zero. So what is forcing my neural network to learn the correct value function instead of just a constant value function? Um, and, and in this loss function as it is, nothing really, but once we impose the boundary condition, which we know by the way, is that at the terminal time of our value function, it should be equals to L of X, which is our target function. And once we impose that, now neural network needs to one, match the boundary condition with L of X. So when, whenever this small t is equals to capital T or a terminal time, whenever I query the neural network at the terminal time, it should give me L of X back and everywhere else it should satisfy the PDE. And that we know means that obtaining our true value function for Hamilton Jacobi rigid model. Okay. Um, now we don't have to restrict ourselves to backward reachable set. We can use the PDE or variational inequality now instead of that PDE as our loss function, because we know for backward reachable two, we need to satisfy not just a PDE, but a variational inequality. And with this new loss function, now we can obtain the backward reachable tube using deep reach. Um, we can also go a step further and we can use the back, the variational inequality for reach avoid tube as, and replace that over here and obtain the reach avoid set using deep reach as well. Um, so now I'm gonna shift gear towards something else. So any question on the idea behind deep reach um, or how we can compute sets of tubes using it? Uh, I have a question. So in order to find the optimal value function, do we need to sample sufficiently large because as long as the dimension goes high, this function may not be a convex function. You do a simple gradient descent, you know, help you uh, get rid of the local minimum. Does that mean we need to sample a lot for, for this? Um, good question. So we, um, yes. So meaning as the, as your system dimension gets higher, we certainly have to sample more, but it depends on something more than just the system dimension. It depends on how complex the underlying value function is. So let's go back to that example of, of a circle versus amoeba, right? In both cases is the same system dimension, meaning they're both like two dimension in that case. But because to represent the value function, uh, amoeba value function is much harder. You have to sample more to get an accurate value function. But yes, in general, the trend you will expect is that as I will go to higher dimension, I will need to sample more. And I will show some concrete examples on the timing and the number of samples you need to, uh, to get these value functions correctly. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, let's go back to the backward reachable set. So for the backward reachable set, our loss function is given by the left-hand side of this PDE, right? So this was my loss function. Now, if you notice, my loss function depends not only on the value function, but its gradients as well. In particular, its state and time gradients. What does it mean for my neural network is that if I'm to optimize my neural network using this loss function, then I should not only be able to represent my value function well, but also the gradients of the value function. So let's see if we can do that. Now, one of the activation function or neuron or non-linearity, whatever you want to call it, that's popular in today's neural networks is ReLU non-linearity. Um, so what ReLU non-linearity does is that it does nothing when the, or sorry, not that it does nothing. It's actually equals to the input whenever the input is positive and it is equals to zero whenever the input is negative, right? And what that means is that the gradient of a ReLU function looks something like this. So it's all is zero in here and it's equals to one in this positive regime, right? So it looks like this piecewise constant gradient function. So 
does, let's see what are the implications of ReLU on D bridge. And for that, let's consider a very simple example of two states, X1 and X2, and time as the input. And also a very simple neural network, which only consists of one layer with three neurons. By the way, um, I'm using a lot of sort of deep learning lingo. So if any of this is unclear to you, please feel free to interrupt me and ask question. Um, so here, uh, what would that mean is that there, there is a value sitting here, a value sitting here, and a value sitting here, right? And then when they finally combine together, they give me my value function. So here what I'm showing you is actually the decision boundary of these different value functions in the state space x1, x2, right? So for example, this line, um, so let me move my window slightly here. So this line, for example, is the decision boundary of the first neuron, this one. What does that mean? Is that it takes the weight from x1, so that is w11 x1, it takes the weight from x2, w12 x2, and from time, which is w13 t, it combines them together, add a term, b1, and then if this term is positive, then it will just output this term as it is. And if it is negative, then it outputs zero, which is what value does. As we saw earlier, if the input is positive, it will just return the input. If it's negative, it will just return the zero, which means that if I look at this line, so ignore the other two black lines, on the right side of this line, the output of the neural network or this first neuron at least will be equal to just this. And on this side of this, it will be zero. On this side of the black line, the gradient of the value function would be some constant, and in particular equals to just these weight parameters. And on this side, it will be simply zero. And similarly, I have the decision boundary for each of the other two neurons as well. And what would end up happening, if you convince yourself, is that in each of these shaded regions, the gradient of the value function is constant. So within this yellow region, the value function gradient with respect to state or time will be constant. Similarly, in orange region, in green region, these will be different in each of these regions, but it, within a region, it will be constant. Do we agree on that? If there's a question, um, feel free to just, in, um, just unmute yourself and ask, because this is important. All right, wonderful. Okay, so gradient is constant in each of these regions. What does that mean? That means I cannot represent a value function whose gradient actually changes with the state in the yellow region with my current neural network. And that's a fundamental problem with value. The gradients are piecewise constant. That means my value cannot represent the value function gradient very well, which is really problematic when you're trying to learn the value function based on its gradients, which is the case for deep reach. So we need to overcome that problem somehow. And, um, and the solution lies in a slightly different activation function, uh, sinusoidal activation functions. So there was this recent paper, well, not so recent now, it was last summer uh, by Professor Gordon Wettstein from uh, Stanford who demonstrate that the sinusoidal activation function instead of ReLU not only represent the function well, but also its gradients very well. Because the, gra because the gradient of the sine are also continuous, right? Gradient of sine is cosine, right? So they are also varying with state. They are not piecewise constant anymore. And what does that mean is that sinusoidal activation function could be a good candidate for deep reach. It has also another advantage. Remember that the safety controller depends on the gradients of value function as well. So gradients of value function are also important if subsequently you wanna obtain the safety control. So if we use sinusoidal activation function, we also have the hope for obtaining the safety controller back. Now let's, we will see in a little bit if it actually works or not, but at least it's hopeful. So that's really, is the summary behind DeepReach. It represents the value function as a neural network 
which takes as input the state and time, uses the sinusoidal activation function at each layer, and then it outputs the value function at that state and time. To learn the parameters of the neural network, we sample state and time randomly at each iteration of training, we minimize our loss function, which will be given by the combination of a PDE and terminal condition if it's backward reachable set. It will be a combination of variation inequality and terminal condition if it's a backward reachable tube. And then we minimize that loss function so as to move the parameters towards a lower loss value. And then we keep repeating this procedure. So question. Yeah. You have a little cartoon of the neural network here. Is yeah. that actually how many you know, layers and, and neurons that you're using? A good question. So I am definitely using three layers. I'm using more neurons than these. So layers is yellow is one layer, blue is second layer and green is third layer. So I'm using three layers in my neural network in the example that I will show, I mean. Um, the neurons, I'm using 512 neurons at each layer. Like why? This this is always so interesting to me, the machine learning stuff. Like, did you just feel like it or like, was there a way to come up with this? So good question. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can answer it. Uh, so, the, so the short answer is no, there's no principal way to select those. There are certain guidelines though, which I can tell you. Uh, one, these neurons are often used as a power of two and that's simply used because the computation on computer is much more efficient when it's power of two. So that's why 512. If you don't use 512, people directly go to 256 typically. They don't like explore with 300. So at least that reduces their option a little bit. Um, now, honestly, um, the number of layers and the, um, the number of neurons do not affect the performance as much as we generally expect in deep learning. At least for deep is that's what I've observed. So. Uh, the examples I'm gonna show, I've also tried them with fewer number of neurons, meaning instead of 512, I used 256. Instead of three layers, I used two layers as well. Um, and I still get very high accuracy. Um, but there, as we go to the higher dimensions, the general rule of thumb is that you wanna use more layers because your value function gets more complex. So. If you only use one layer, then you are only representing the value function as a summation of some bunch of bunch of sine functions, right? If you add the second layer, then those sine functions are feeding into themselves, then you get sine of sine. And then if you add the third layer, sine of sine of sine, right? Like those are the kind of things that happen. So as your value function grows more complex, you generally need more layers. That's, that's generally the rule of thumb, but what is that exact number? You know, I start with the smallest one and then increase it up to it until it works. But honestly, in, throughout my studies, I use only three layer neural networks, each with the same size and that worked really well. Okay. Uh, I have so, a question about, uh, do you use techniques like batch normalization and drop out and all that, you know, uh, traditional I don't. neural network stuff? Okay. I, I really don't. I mean, maybe they will improve the performance, but I absolutely don't in this case. Okay, thank you. One more question. Why not just like sigmoids? Like why, why are signs so special? Like why not uh, just something that's smooth? Just, just hold that question for okay, two more right, right, right. Yes. So why not the sigmoid? Why not ReLU? Why not 10 h You know, I, I will come to that question in a second. But, but really, I think a lot of, um, okay. Actually, hold on that question, <laughs> sorry. Um, so let's start with um, a canonical example, Air 3D. Sylvia, have they seen Air 3D example before? Uh, we talked about pursuit evasion games, but no, okay. I don't think that we've gone through anything. Oh, all right, so let me quickly explain what Air 3D mean. Uh, I think this is, by the way, just a lingo that we use in Clear's lab. I don't think it's a standard name or anything. Um, this, this system represents a pursuer, pursuit evasion game between two aircrafts each of which is a three-dimensional vehicle. So evader is trying to escape as much as it can, and pursuer is actually trying to collide with the evader or want to pursue the evader, in other words. Now, the, the, the backward reachable tube in this case will represent the set of states from which evader can successfully avoid the pursuer, right? So meaning, 
meaning there exists a control strategy for the evader to avoid the pursuer forever. And the dynamics between the pursuer and evader can be represented as this three-dimensional system, which is essentially the relative dynamics between the two vehicles, each of which has a Dubin's car dynamics. Does that make sense? I can, I can, I can repeat that one more time. So the dynamics here are simply the relative dynamics between the two aircrafts, where X1 is the relative X position, X2 is the relative Y position, and X3 is the relative heading between the vehicles. To obtain these dynamics, you can start from the Dubin's car dynamics for each vehicle. The Dubin's car dynamics simply mean that position derivative is V cosine theta, V sine theta, and theta dot is equals to omega. Right? So if you take those two dynamics and if you compute the relative dynamics between those two vehicles, you get these equations. Um, now, why this information is important will be clear in a few slides. So remember that I can solve this game in the relative coordinates between the two vehicles, or I can solve this game in the full six dimensional system, which is the joint system of pursuer and evader. And we will try both. Okay, so here, um, both the evader and the pursuer vehicle has bounds on their angular speed, right? And they're moving at a constant speed, uh, VE and VP respectively, right? Control to my system is the control of the evader vehicle, which is the angular speed of the evader vehicle. And the disturbance to my system is the control input of the pursuer vehicle, right? So again, I want to compute the set of all states from which control, in other words, evader, can avoid the pursuer forever, whereas the pursuer is trying to actively collide with the evader. The target set is represented where the relative position between the two aircrafts is smaller than a threshold R, meaning the two vehicles are in the close proximity of each other. That's my target set, right? That's the setup, okay. So here is what the backward reachable tube looks like for the relative heading of pi by two between the two vehicles. Now, green, light green, light green, is the backward reachable tube obtained using helper OC, right? Because the three-dimensional system, we can solve it exactly using helper OC. Um, and pink is the backward reachable tube obtained using deep reach. Um, and you can see they align very closely with each other. But deep reach also gives us the value function. So let's compare that as well. So in the middle panel, is the value function, again, for this slice of heading pi by two, obtained using helper OC or level set toolbox. And then on the rightmost is I'm showing you the value function obtained using deep reach. And they actually match up up to an accuracy of 10 to the power minus four in this case. Okay, now let's see what happens when we use the deep reach idea, but with ReLU activation functions. So instead of sigmoid, instead of sorry, sinusoidal activation function, I'm using ReLU. And you see that the quality of the value function decreases as you reach the region where the gradients are changing very rapidly of the value function. And that's exactly the problem we expected with ReLU. And you can also do this analysis, not just for ReLU, but for another activation, other activation functions, uh, the two most popular one being sigmoid and 10H. Uh, these plots are just showing that the mean square error is high. So it's not so informative, but let me discuss why you get bad performance with sigmoid and 10H. Now sigmoid and 10H, both activation functions actually have continuous gradients, just like, sigmoid, uh, just like sinusoid. So it does not have that ReLU problem of piecewise constant gradient. But it has a slightly different problem. And the problem is that their gradients saturate very fast. And that causes the problem again when you're trying to learn the value function based on these gradients. In fact, the saturation of the gradients of sigmoid and tenet is the, the fundamental reason for why ReLU became the state of the art activation function in deep learning because those gradients saturate very fast. So you were not able to train not just deep reach, but other neural networks in general that easily. 
I, I had a question about the, so the gradients of sine are periodic, right? So does that pose any issues uh, with this? So the gradients of sine are periodic, but the thing is that's for individual sine, right? Now, when you combine sort of, when you take the cascaded signs, then the frequency changes. And when you do multiple over these, the actual period becomes very high or very low. So it's, I mean, I think in other words, what I'm trying to say, like you can ask the same question about Fourier series, right? So let's just consider a single layer sinusoid network. Each of those signs is obviously periodic, but overall Fourier series we know can represent any continuous function very well, because by combining signs of different frequencies, you can change the period of the overall function. Um, any other question on this before I move to the next example? Okay. So as I said uh, that the same system, I can also pose in the, in the actual states of the evader and pursuer. So we are no longer considering the relative states between the two vehicles, but the joint state space of the two vehicles. So that will be a six dimensional system because each of the vehicle has three dimensional dynamics. Um, again, my control will be WE, meaning the angular speed of evader vehicle. And my disturbance would be the um, angular speed of pursuer vehicle. And my target set simply represents the set of states in which the position distance between the two vehicle is less than or equals to R again. Now, what happens is that this system is six dimensional system, right? So we cannot solve it using helper OC. We can solve the three dimensional system, which we did. Um, Although the two systems are exactly the same, the backward reachable tube for the two systems should exactly be the same. It's just the two different coordinate system in which you are solving the problem. And that is exactly pointing to the problem with grid-based methods, right? Like they are no longer now scaling with the complexity of the value function, which hasn't changed between these two systems. It is only scaling with the dimensionality of the state space. So here with this system, I again use deep reach. Right? And I obtain the exact same value function in the exact same time frame with the exact same accuracy. And as that's what we should expect, if a, if a, if a method is actually trying to leverage the representation of the value function and not the dimensionality of the state space for a faster computation. Does, does that, does that um, example make sense? So let's scale it even further. So now let's go to three vehicle example. So here we have two evaders and one pursuer, right? So here the situation is that both evaders are trying to avoid a collision with the pursuer or with each other. Whereas the pursuer is trying to collide with either of the evaders. And that will be success case for, evade, for the pursuer. Now, again, we have Dubinsky dynamics for each vehicle. So the total, system dimension will be nine dimensional system, right? Because there are three vehicles. My control inputs will be the controls of evader one and evader two, and my disturbance would be the control of the pursuer vehicle. And again, I'm trying to find the set of states from which both evaders can successfully avoid the collision with the pursuer or with each other at all times. So backward reachable two. And, <laughs> If I write down the sort of math of that target sets, it's just like writing down the same thing, which is the distance between evader one and evader two should not should be less than R, or the distance between evader one and pursuer less than R, or the distance between evader two and pursuer is less than equals to R. If either of those conditions are satisfied, meaning there is a collision between one of the pair of the vehicles, and that's our set of unsafe states. Is uh, any question on setup? Great, okay. So now this is a nine dimensional system. So a direct computation of Hamilton Jacob uh, of the backward reachable tube in this case is not tractable, right? So the one way to compute an approximation to the backward reachable tube in this case is to compute the pairwise collision sets. So you compute a 
set of states from which pursuer one and evader one can avoid the collision, which we can do because this problem we can pose in the relative dynamics between pursuer one and evader one, and we can solve it. Similarly, we compute the pairwise collision set between pursuer one and evader two, and then we compute a pairwise collision set between evader one and evader two. And then we take the union of all those sets and say like, oh, this is my back original two. And that slice of that backward reachable tube is what I'm showing you in the green here. So let's just first focus on the leftmost panel. Um, what am I showing here? It's a nine dimensional value function. So you have to bear with me because we are seeing a two dimensional slice of that nine dimensional value function. And it is in the position space of the pursuer. So X7 and X8 are the X and Y position of the pursuer. This arrow will indicate the heading of the pursuer. So pursuer is facing this way. Now, the evader one is at this position and at this heading. Similarly, evader two is at this position and facing this heading. So this is the slice of the backward reachable tube I'm visualizing. And this green is the union of the pairwise collision set computed between the vehicles. And pink is the slice of the backward reachable tube computed using deep reach. So clearly the green region is contained within the pink region as it should, because if, if the vehicles, if one of the pair is colliding, surely the three vehicles overall is colliding. But you see there is a whole bunch of states which are outside the green region, but in the pink region. And these are the states where the three-way interaction between vehicles is important. In other words, if the, for example, if the pursuer starts at this pink position, the circle over here, which is what I'm showing the trajectories corresponding to that in the middle panel, then as it moves towards the blue aircraft, which is evader one, evader one tries to avoid it, but while doing so, it cannot avoid a collision with evader two, which this pairwise collision set was not able to capture. And so these three-way interactions, now we can capture using hamilton jacobi reachability as we should, if we can compute the full nine-dimensional backward reachable tube. And, and surely if you start outside the backward reachable tube, which is this gray position over here, then evaders do have a control strategy to avoid a collision with both the pursuer and with each other, which is what the rightmost panel is showing here in the trajectory space. I have one more example to show, um, unless there are any questions on this. Uh, is the red dashed line uh, the R, the, the safety yes. radius? Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, thanks, for, thanks for pointing that out. I forgot I completely <laughs> missed to explain these inlets. Okay, so what is this? This is DE1, E2P is the minimum pairwise distance between the vehicles. So meaning that if DE1, E2P goes below capital R, which is this red line, which means that collision has happened. And what is the dash gray? Is the pairwise collision set, sorry, pairwise collision, excuse me, pairwise distance between the vehicles computed using the union of the pairwise reachable set. So computed using the green backward reachable tube. So clearly we are saying that, oh, I'm lying outside this union or this green region means I would never collide with the other vehicle. And that's what this dash gray line is representing, but actually you end up colliding, which is this solid gray line is representing. Thank you. Okay. Um, this last example is from our autonomous driving application. And so far, if you notice, we computed backward reachable tubes using deep reach, right? So in this example, we will compute a backward reach avoid tube using deep reach. Okay, so what's the setting? Um, the setting is called the narrow passage setting in autonomous driving setting. Here, essentially the white vehicle is starting at this position and it's driving in its lane and the orange vehicle is starting at this position and driving in its own lane. So that's the oncoming traffic. Um, except that there is a stranded vehicle in the lane of the white car. 
So to continue its lane, it needs to change into the other lane and then come back to its lane and continues diving, right? So imagine this is a garbage truck or something collecting garbage and then you need to just nudge around it and then come back to your lane. That's sort of the aesthetic we're talking about. Um, now, why this problem is hard is because if white car does not do it carefully, then it can collide with the orange vehicle. Right? So here I'm showing you the nominal trajectory of the white car and orange car. And if they will just follow this nominal trajectory, clearly there's a collision at this point. Um, so what is our target here? Our target is that Q1 reaches T1, Q2 reaches T2. So that's my target set. And my avoid set is that there should not be any collision between Q1 and standard vehicle, Q2 and standard vehicle, and Q1 and Q2. So no collision is my avoid set. And my target set is reach, you know, eventual, uh, eventual lane points here. Sorry, is the control space, the control of both cars uh, or just one of them? Oh, very good question, yes. Uh, thanks for keeping me honest here. So yes, the, the, the control, um, so the two vehicles in this case are cooperating, meaning the overall control space is actually the control of Q1 plus Q2. There's no disturbance in this setting. I, as far as I remember, yes, there's no disturbance in this setting. But I will show what happens when they do not cooperate. So I will um, I will show that example as well. Thank you. Okay, and that's actually that's one of the reason why reachability is so beautiful. So uh, just two more slides. But let's first see what happens when the two vehicles are coordinating. So we computed this reach avoid set using deep reach. So in the solid white line is the nominal trajectory which I showed on the previous slide. Similarly, the solid orange line is the nominal trajectory of the orange vehicle. Now what reachability does is very interesting. It actually does nothing when the safety of the system is not at risk, but whenever the safety of the system is at risk, it actually make the white car move a little bit towards the stranded vehicle. So undercut its nominal trajectory. At the same time, it make the orange vehicle swerve around the road so as to create this clearance between the vehicles. And once they pass each other, then they converge back to the nominal trajectory. which is what, if you intuitively think that's what happened when you are in these sort of interaction settings and which is what we would expect out of a safety controller, right? Wait, and quick question, are they, are they, I forget, I think you already said this, but are they moving at a constant speed? Like they can't just- Oh, no, no, no. So, okay, so actually that, that's also a good point. I did not mention the dynamics at all, right? Uh, the, it's a 10 dimensional system. So each vehicle is a five dimensional system with the state being X, Y, their speed, their heading, and their steering angle. Okay, um, so why why didn't it like have one, I don't like slow down, wait for the other one to go by? Good question. It totally depends on the scenario, right? So here it does not do that because if it's possible to maintain its speed and actually get to its target faster then the reachability will give me that solution. Sure. There are other scenarios where indeed this vehicle is moving so fast that if it does not come to a complete stop for this vehicle, it would collide into the orange car. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you imagine that if the orange car is moving at a very fast speed, the, red, the white car would come to a complete stop behind this vehicle. And once the orange car passes, it will go around it. And those sort of solutions also emerge automatically out of reachability. That's so cool. And even though in this case, I have computed the cooperative set between the two vehicles, meaning both orange vehicle and white car are trying to avoid the collision with each other, right? Because they're both control inputs that are trying to avoid the avoid set. Um, but the non-cooperative set is naturally contained in reachability, right? Because it also gives us the least restrictive control. In other words, what I mean is that now I have fixed the trajectory of the white vehicle. So I said like, I'm exactly gonna do no matter what orange car try to do. I have, I'm not taking any responsibility of avoiding the collision with the orange vehicle. So white car has fixed this trajectory. And now orange car realized that, oh, white car is not cooperating with me at all. To, so to remain safe, I need to swerve even more than before so as to avoid a collision with the white car. 
So with the same backward reachable tube, with the same safety controller, we can sort of do these different scenarios where in one case, they both are cooperating together to avoid the collision. And as a result, will only deviate slightly from their trajectories. Or one is this very aggressive driver and just decide that I'm not gonna cooperate at all. And so the other vehicle makes even higher deviation from its trajectory to avoid the collision. And so reachability gives us, because of the dynamic programming nature of the reachability, it gives us all these solution in one go. Cool. Any question on this? Okay, well, that brings me to uh, my, my summary slide then. So what we, uh, what we saw today is, uh, is, is, is essentially a machine learning method to compute a high quality approximation of the value function and safety controller both. And we can use it to compute reachable sets and tubes, reach avoid sets and tubes with and without disturbances. Um, but this is far from overcoming because of dimensionality. There's a whole bunch of problem. One is related to Nikhil's question, which is how to perform online computation. This is a purely offline method. Each of the reachable tubes that I have sort of presented today takes about 17 to 18 hours to compute. Um, the one nice thing is that for from starting from three dimension to 10 dimension, all of them take 17 hours. That's the nice thing because I don't change my neural network size at all, but it still takes 17 hours. No, no <laughs> getting away from that fact. So it's fundamentally a method which is suitable for offline computation yet. Um, I'm not providing any safety guarantees. Um, it's, it's providing clearly a very good approximation as we saw by comparison results, but I have no formal guarantees of safety, especially in the presence of disturbances. And this is because you're only sampling like a portion of the space? I think it's more than sampling. I mean, even though my theoretically, my value function, once the neural network parameter converges, it should be, the PD should actually be equal to zero, but it would never be in practice. So I will minimize the loss function, but I will never be actually to actually satisfy the PD exactly. And as long as I don't do that, I might be, over approximating the safe set or under approximating the safe set. Um, so I don't have any safety guarantees. One thing though I would say is in the absence of disturbance, we can obtain the conservative approximation of the backward reachable tube on the right side using deep reach. So what does that mean? So let's ignore the disturbance for a second. You computed a backward reachable tube so remember that deep reach also gives you a policy, right? A controller, safety controller. To take that safety controller, you simulate it forward. And if you actually are able to avoid the unsafe state using that controller, that means that state is indeed safe. In other words, a policy which is safe per deep reach will indeed be safe. In the absence of disturbance is very important there. Similarly, a policy which is reaching the target set using deep reach will indeed be in my backward reachable tube. So I will obtain a conservative approximation of the backward reachable tube on the correct side. But in the absence of disturbance, in the presence of disturbance, all those guarantees go out of window. And then one question that I don't know is certainly I've been able to compute the backward reachable tube for all the systems that I presented today with the same time complexity, how high dimensional can I really go? And what does that time of training the neural network depends on in a system? These are some like some open questions I'm still thinking about, about deep reach, but, uh, but that's where we stand currently. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause here and maybe answer any questions if there are any, or we can discuss about um, any suggestions you might have in answering these questions. Uh, I have a quick question. When you said like it takes around 17 to like 18 hours to run it, is it because of 
the deep reach neural network algorithm or is it just like because you're sampling so much that I don't know yeah that's um, so so I think they are very tied together right so in in within that 17 hour there are 100,000 iterations that are happening and within that 100,000 each of that 100,000 iteration is essentially sample a whole bunch of state and time and then optimize the neural network. If your question is that sampling takes more time or the optimization takes more time, then the answer is optimization takes way more time. Like, oh. I mean, if, if I would, if I want to just sample 100,000 points, I can do within, I mean, even half a second is a conservative mm -hmm. number. Like half a second is even very pessimistic. I can do, I can sample 100,000 samples way faster than that in today's world with okay. modern compute. But optimizing these parameters of the neural network takes a lot of time. There's actually something more than that, which I think I I just realized I forgot to mention, and it was related to Sylvia's question, is we do not just actually sample time randomly. So the way I train deep reach network is through curriculum learning. And what does that mean? It means that I, when I start my neural network, I only tell it that, okay, let's take a small step. In the first step, we will only learn the terminal value function. So your job is to only compute L of X or to learn L of X at each state. Then I say, let's increase the time horizon a little bit. So now I'm going from say T minus Delta T to capital T. And I only sample time within this horizon and state can be anything. So now I'm telling the neural network to now learn the correct value function within this small time horizon. Then I make it T minus two delta T, T minus three delta T and just keep expanding that horizon slowly. So in this learning loop of deep reach, there is almost a loop running for time as well, right? Because you are slowly moving time and that takes some time quite a bit. Like that increases the learning time quite a bit. And that curriculum learning is very important to make it work, right? Because otherwise, otherwise the great the neural network just messes up. It just is not able to learn that complex value function in one go at all states and at all times. I have a question regarding the the training because you mentioned you use curriculum learning. So so by you're basically adding samples to your sample set, to your data set. Um, as the curriculum goes, do you sample from this pool of data as in do batches or do you go through all of them? Because or else I imagine as you go on to further in the time horizon, there will be catastrophic forgetting and, and so on. But that's a, a common scenario in curriculum learning. So I was, uh, I was wondering about the training. Um, a good point. So, so what I'm doing is I'm I'm not sort of keeping a track of all the points that I sampled in the past. At each iteration, I just randomly sample, even when I'm doing the curriculum learning. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that when I'm learning the value function for say, T minus Delta T to capital T, the, the states that I sample would not be same necessarily as when I'm computing the value function from T minus two Delta T to capital T. And the reason I don't need to do that is because I have a self-supervised learning method. Generally people reuse the same batch is because a lot of times it's a supervised learning problem. So you don't have more data. I don't care what samples I actually use because for any such sample, I know what the loss function I should be minimizing. So even though I can reuse the same batches if I like to, I don't have to. And I currently, I don't at least. Right, interesting. Um, do you run into scenarios like with complex dynamics that it's, it's um, very hard to learn such a function? So um, so in the systems that I tried, I did not run into this problem. I'm understanding where you're coming from, like this uh, for, this forgetting problem that you're mentioning. Um, but, but one thing that helps, I think in my opinion, a little bit uh, with that problem is that at each time step, what I also do is I sample some of the points only at the terminal time. So, so in other words, what I'm trying to say is that suppose at one learning iteration, I have 60,000 points, right? That I'm sampling on which I will apply that loss function. So my batch size is 60,000. 
in that 60,000, I will fix that 5,000 of the points would have T equals to capital T for which I know the ground truth. Interesting, that's really cool. And what that does is that sort of constantly providing that signal, the true value function signal in the system so as to avoid that forgetting over time. Right, wow, okay, thank you, that's cool. Yeah, sorry, I, I should have mentioned all these details. I just, <laughs> uh, I just find the other part so much exciting that I just miss these aspects. <laughs> well, we have people from very different backgrounds, so it's useful to have the chance to ask these questions. Um, so you, you talked about when this method works really well, when this method doesn't work well, uh, what about like uh, the, the other two questions of what resources um, are available in terms of learning about this method or tools for applying it? Okay, um, yes, so resources for this method. Um, so I, I think, uh, well, I think I, there are four types of resources which I think are important, um, depending on how much background you have. The first thing is learning the basics of the neural network. Um, so Sylvia, I sent you some references for that, but I can send you more. So just understanding what the pass size, what these loss functions, all this you know, lingo mean. The second is the basics of Hamilton Jacobi reachability, which I know Sylvia has done a great job at. So, so I, or like, I mean, knowing what that is. The third is this paper that I cited from Stanford is very, very cool too, to, to, to get a little bit more intuition for why sinusoidal activation functions help with, uh, with gradients. And then the fourth is, well, deep reach paper. So I think, uh, I think, I mean, these four- could And that's be... on archive already, right? Yes, yes. But what I can also do is I can compile all these four resources and send you in a single email, so yeah. Right, great, thanks. And then uh, your second question was about tool. Yes, so <laughs> I'm, I'm actually actively working on that. Uh, I, uh, because I mean, Sylvia pointed out to me that she also wanted to use it. So um, I'm still cleaning up the code, but my hope is that by the time at least the, uh, so this paper is currently under review, by the time that review completes, I, I'm also hoping to release the code. So I can also drop a note to Sylvia so that she can drop a note to you guys in case uh, you want to use it. And I'm happy to obviously answer any questions while you're using that tool. Also. Thanks. So uh, I had a question, I guess you mentioned, you already mentioned that the time uh, it takes is about the same. And uh, so is the sample complexity uh, about the same as well for different dimensionalities or yes. does it go yes. up? Yes, is the sample complexity is also the same. I'm, I'm, so I mentioned the best size of 60,000, right? So I'm using mm -hmm. the same best size across all my systems. Okay. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of interesting uh, because what is that telling me personally is that these backward reachable tube do not grow too much in complexity as we are going to these high dimensional systems, right? Because otherwise I would not expect the sample and time complexity to be exactly the same. Um, and so that's why I think representing, using alternative represent for the value function, not necessarily in the deep reach way, but in other ways could also be a very cool sort of research direction to look into given, given sort of these findings. And uh, just for the planes, I was curious how how many planes did you uh, try together, and what was kind of the max where you um, saw? I have tried up to four. Um, I, I I did work in the past on like about fifty planes flying at the same time, so one day I want to try it on that. So if there are any volunteer to who want to try that, <laughs> definitely let me know. I'm happy to like share my thoughts. Uh, but but four is the highest I've tried. So the highest dimension system would be 12 that I've tried so far. Uh, you, speaking on, on Kiel's thing, oh, sorry, Atien, I'll, I'll make mine short. Um, uh, the question was, uh, you know, he was mentioning, and you mentioned at the beginning that the weirder the value function shape is, maybe the better you have to define it. Is there a way of like being able to tell by like how much your updates are changing, like how many more points you need to sample? That's a good point. Um, I mean, so, so the theoretically the answer is yes. Practically, I don't know how to do it. So let me share sure. what I mean by that. So theoretically in machine learning, there's this concept of VC theory uh, or VC dimensionality, which is essentially supposed to represent the, the, the true dimensionality of the underlying system that you're trying to, or underlying value function that you're trying to represent in this case, meaning how high dimensional it really is. So if we know what that VC dimensionality is, 
and where that VC dimensionality is high, then I can particularly target my sampling procedure in those states to learn the value function much faster. But when you just tell me this is a dynamical system, I don't know how to do it, except in some cases. For reach avoid set, for example, I know that my value function in the avoid set is useless. I know that it should just not go in the avoid set. So I can bias my sampling away from the avoid set because those are just wasted sample. So that those tricks you can apply. Thanks. But I didn't want to play with that too much in my first iteration because that's yeah. a, um, sorry. Any other question? I think maybe Yachin. Oh, hi, I have a question. And how we verify the validation of the approximate value function? Um, sorry, how do I validate the value function? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I was only able to validate it for the three-dimensional system because that's the only one I can compute using helper OC. So those are the validation results that I showed. Starting from um, the, the nine-dimensional and 10-dimensional value, for, uh, um, okay, sorry. For six dimension value function, I can also validate it because I can, from that full backward reachable tube, I can look at the relative coordinates between these system and see if that value function matches with the relative uh, coordinate value function. But from nine dimension onwards, I could not. What I did though is, which is not at all a good validation scheme, is I took that nine dimensional system, I make one of the I, I may converted this nine dimensional system into a six dimensional system by considering the relative coordinates between um, evader and pursuer. So evaders and pursuer. So the first three states are the relative coordinates between evader one and pursuer and the last three are between evader two and pursuer. The six dimension grid, I stole using helper OC with 10 grid points in each direction. <laughs> and, and then I roughly looked at the shape. So they were matching up quite well, but it was not good enough to actually compute an accuracy number on that because you know 10 grid points is nothing. Actually, I could not even use 10 grid points in some cases. So, uh, so that's that's what I've tried. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So, for like um, small uh, lower dimensional system, uh, when you can run it on uh, helper OC to have the ac the accurate. Um, backward reachable set or tube. Um, could you please also talk about a bit about how you can give it the article bound on um, your approximation and the true underlying backward reach reachable tube? Ooh, good question. Okay, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna think on the fly with you because, because the, I don't know the true answer to that. So your question is that even when I know the true backward reachable tube, how can I compute the approximation bounds uh, on my method, right? Yes, yes. So, so well, one thing that I can look into in that case is what in machine learning people call like cross validation error or validation error. Uh, it's just a fancy word for take a whole bunch of samples at which you compute the true value function. You know that, and you look at what your method did and then you just compute the difference between that and average, average that difference. Um, so this, yeah, as I said, this is called cross validation error, but it's simply looking at um, the samples which you haven't used during training, how well your method is performing on those states. Um, so that is that is that could be one way to validate the error in the um, in the in the matter. And when I was computing that mean square error, ten to the power, I was saying that it's ten to the power minus four roughly. I was exactly doing that. I was taking my value function computer using helper OC on all the grid points. And then I was computing the mean square error with respect to those values and what I obtained using my method and what actually is being obtained using helper OC. I might have a technical question uh, in uh, regarding the car example. Mm -hmm. um, like when you say, well, you, uh, when, like when the two cars are not cooperating, like the white car is just fixing its own trajectory. Um, how do you do that uh, in your code? Do you just fix, uh, I, I, I guess uh, you, you just using your uh, neural network trained on the 60 space 
but fix three of the dimensions and um, use the the remaining three dimensions to give control to the orange orange car. Good question. So what happens in that case is you know reachability at each state, which is ten dimensional in this case, right? At oh, each yeah. state, reachability would prescribe me a control for both the orange car and white car. And that and that control would mean getting to the target as quickly as it can when you're inside the backward reachable tube. And when you're at the boundary, that means you need to apply that for ensuring safety. What white car does is completely ignores the recommendation of reachability. It's so like, I'm gonna constantly keep applying the control that would make me follow this trajectory. Mm -hmm. And there's an, then it's only on the orange car to ensure safety. So what would happen is that if the orange car and white car would, are cooperating, right? Then you will remain deeper inside the backward reachable tube if you start deeper inside the backward reachable tube. Whereas when the white car is just ignoring the recommendation, then you will quickly move towards the boundary of the backward reachable tube. And now it's on the, only on the orange car to make sure that the overall system remains inside the backward reachable tube. Yes. But, but backward reachable, so what I practically, what that means is that I ignore the control command coming out of deep reach for the white car. Okay, so they're both using the same pre-computation. Is that right? Like you're, they're both, you're computing the BRT for when they're cooperating, but then online, one of them isn't cooperating. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So with this, that's the point. Like, which is the same with the same computation, we can simulate it for very different scenarios because reachability not only gives us the safe controller but also least restrictive control, right? So I can I can apply keep applying that control if I would like to. Thank you. But it's not adversarial. That's very important. So it's not cooperating, but it's not adversarial. That it does not capture. Meaning when I, the right, sorry. I just want to mention that we're, I know that uh, it's class, class time. So if people want to leave, you're, you're welcome to leave. Why don't we take a second to like, thank Somal. Thank you, Somal. That was wonderful. Uh, and maybe we can steal a couple more minutes from him if, if there are still more questions. But I just wanted to let people know that they, they can leave. Any more questions? For those of you who are actually implementing this, any questions in your code? No, it's going well, cool. Okay then. Well, thank you so much, Somal. This was fantastic. Unsurprisingly, your talks are always wonderful. Uh, and uh, we look forward to, to seeing the references and the code. Sounds good. Thank you, Sylvia. And thank you everybody for participating. Really enjoyed our conversation. Bye.